Well, welcome everyone to the Hawaii Venture Capital Association's first meeting of 2011. And this is our uh, one of our favorite meetings because uh, this is our 10th, I believe, 10th Venture Capital Deal of the Year Award Ceremony. That's hard to believe, 10 of those, yeah? Fantastic. Um, we are very excited to acknowledge these companies uh, because as many of you know, it's been a tough couple of years for uh, financing startup ventures. And uh, we have some really exemplary companies that I can't wait to introduce you to, but I'm going to force you to go through a long program, just like they do at the Academy Awards, to build up suspense. Um, <laughs> no booze, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure it could be had, but uh, it's not on the menu. Um, but before we go on, you know, we are all about networking. We are a membership-sponsored organization, so your members' uh, members dues uh, is what makes this possible. Our board is all volunteer. Um, Gail is our only uh, a paid uh, employee, and so this is something we do out of the uh, love for entrepreneurship, the need for capital formation in Hawaii, and the value of bringing together such great people as yourselves. Give yourselves a hand. Great group of people. What a great group. Thank you. Okay, now it's my turn for a couple of, of shameless plugs here. I wanted to call your attention to the fact that we have a brand new website, uh, hvca.org, and uh, among many of the cool things about it is it's a place for you to opt into our mailing list where you can find out about our great meetings. Um, if you miss a meeting, uh, thanks to ThinkTech and Jay Fidel, we always videotape them, so we put those up on the website as well as other interesting uh, news uh, features. And, um, you know, as I said, we're a membership organization. Members will be getting an email shortly uh, letting you know how to get into the member side of the site and update your profile. So be looking for that because uh, we want to make sure you have the member directory up to date. And I'll send, be sending something to you shortly. Also, quickly, let me mention a couple of great events. You know, um, we've had such success with the events we've been doing with ThinkTech uh, that we're going to keep on doing it. And um, uh, really, frankly, couldn't do some of these events without ThinkTech. You know, our agriculture event had over 200 people in attendance, and uh, we expect to have some really big uh, half-day events um, in the coming months because we've got such a great facility here at the Plaza Club. Uh, February 24th, we're going to be on our fourth Thursday of February, uh, we're doing an in-depth drill down on APEC, uh, which is all the buzz, and uh, just how APEC will benefit businesses in Hawaii. Uh, so something to stay tuned for. On March 23rd, which is not our typical fourth Thursday, because we're doing a half-day event, um, to really look at a real in-depth look at the housing challenge in Hawaii. Uh, you know, where is all the affordable housing and how are we going to make it happen? Um, and coming up in April 26 at our normal Thursday meeting at lunch, uh, we've got some top experts on China investing. China investing in Hawaii, Hawaii investing opportunities in China. So we'll look at both sides of that coin and uh, hope you can join us for that if you have any interest in, in uh, the China investment opportunities. Um, once again, Jay already uh, told you about ThinkTech, but if you haven't tuned in to ThinkTech on 016 at 1030 on Sunday evenings, you really should do it. It's a fabulous, high quality, high def production uh, that has you know, lots of cool stuff about tech, energy, um, interviews with great people, and really looking at Hawaii's global future. And it's not only on at, at 10.30 on Sunday, which you can set your DVR to record if you don't stay up that late. It's also on five other times during the week and on um, you know, their playback feature. Okay, and I watch it every time it's on, so you should too. Okay, um, now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, this is a gentleman who actually came to Hawaii from California, bought property here 15 years ago, you said, and actually moved here to retire about, uh, what, 10 years ago? 
Um, and uh, he didn't stay retired for long. Uh, this guy uh, is just an energizer bunny. Um, he, he started the uh, Kipapa Lecture Series at the Scheidler School of Business before it was, was the Scheidler School of Business, tapping into his network of mainland VCs and, and uh, power brokers and, and uh, corporate titans to come and talk to the business students and the community about um, what's going on uh, in their lives. A great lecture series, uh, which we endeavor to tell you about if you sign up and be on our mailing list. He also uh, was one of the founders of HiBeam, which is an accelerator mentor program open to entrepreneurs who want to tap the uh, Rolodexes. We don't have Rolodexes anymore, but who want to tap the Rolodexes of some really experienced people like John and some of uh, his colleagues. Um, you might know that uh, Hoku Scientific, Dustin Shindo's company, uh, also a Deal of the Year award winner, was uh, one of the first clients of HiBeam and uh, obviously went IPO and is going great guns. Um, he is also the founder of the Entrepreneurs Foundation. And if you were here last November for our Entrepreneur of the Year Award, you would know that uh, we honored him uh, in the entrepreneurship category for a social entrepreneur. And he'll tell us a little bit about Entrepreneurs Foundation. Uh, let's see, I can't believe how busy you are in your retirement here. Uh, he's also one of the founders of Startup Capital Ventures. We heard a little bit about that from Tim uh, in November at uh, Entrepreneur of the Year. And in his spare time, he's the exec executive chairman of Central Pacific Bank, uh, working on a little half billion dollar, that's billion with a B, a turnaround effort. So please warmly welcome our speaker today, Mr. John Dean. Good afternoon. So, uh, I'm going to do a, I think I, uh, some of you, I'm going to do a, I was going to say bimodal. Some say, I hope it's not bi bipolar, but a uh, <laughs> break up on CPB. Just really give you an update of what we're doing there. And then the other part I'd like to speak about is the venture industry and just some comments I have in terms of the venture industry and trends I see that are impacting, will impact the industry, not just the mainland but also uh, here uh, in Hawaii. But where's Leanne Miyasato back here, who is executive director of the Entrepreneurs Foundation. So I asked Bill for permission just to do a little pitch on EF Hawaii, Entrepreneurs Foundation of Hawaii. And before I start, they said I was the founder. And uh, really, there's uh, Billy Richardson out there. Billy, ra raise your hand. It was really Billy Richardson. And I think Greg Kim is here. Where's Greg? Is Greg there? Boy in the back, raise your hand, Greg. Is he hiding? There he is. But really, it was the three of us getting together and seeing if we might model what was being done in Silicon Valley. And going to Leanne, and I'd say the four of us really putting together a plan. And for all entrepreneurs out there, let me just do a little bit of a sales pitch. And I'll try to be fast. But um, there's a lot of startup companies uh, in Hawaii, but elsewhere throughout the United States that really don't have the time to give back to the community and certainly don't have the cash. And the, the concept behind the Entrepreneurs Foundation is that you would don donate stock, so it's a non-cash item, so it's not really hitting your pocketbook. If you don't make it, it doesn't cost you anything. But that stock would be gifted to the EF Hawaii, and that could be 25, 50,000 or more of stock value at the uh, most recent round or last round or first round of financing. Uh, we would then partner with you, uh, put events together for you with other startup firms, also bring resources, not just from Hawaii but Silicon Valley, to assist you. And the thought is at the liquidity event, hopefully those shares would be 3x, 5x more than the original. There's a tax benefit in this, so that there is an attack, a tax on the gross up. The firm, the founders that were in the liquidity event, if it was an IPO, 50% of the proceeds of those funds would go back to the company in the form of a 501c3. So really seeding companies in terms of starting their own nonprofits within those corporations. And really, I think that's what's needed, not just here, but throughout the United States in terms of the future leaders in different communities. 
as we see large corporations disappearing. Um, the other advantage which we did here in Hawaii was a lot of those companies aren't going to IPO. They're going to be sold. So we set it up is that the 50% of the, the value of those shares would go to the founders in the form of a 501c3 so that they themselves individually, collectively, could give back, give back to the community. It's really something I think all of you should consider. Uh, it's a wonderful way to give back. It's a wonderful way to help the community that you live in. And really, for startups, there's no dollar cost. So that's my pitch. How'd I do, Leanne, okay? <laughs> so okay, this afternoon I'm going to talk about two topics. A Central Pacific Bank and then the venture capital industry. Are you in a, I'll kind of give you the thing. We have a little bit of technical stuff here, but Bill's going to help out. Um, with regard to Central Pacific, I'd like to give you an update in terms of our fundraising efforts. And I'll try to do it without making it too much of a commercial. I'm wondering, can people in the back hear me? And then with regard to the venture industry, as I said earlier, I'd just like to share my thoughts with some trends that I'm seeing in this industry today. I think for Central Pacific Bank, I think it's important that we look at some of our challenges uh, over the past few years to really fully appreciate uh, what our employees have recently accomplished. We began incurring losses, I think it's well known to all of you, in 2008. But it was really the third quarter of 2009 that we realized our record loss of $183 million. We're going to give you some press releases I'm sure that you're familiar with. Um, this was followed by a fourth quarter loss of uh, $98 million. And then in April of 2010, uh, we announced my arrival as executive chairman of Central Pacific Bank. Uh, I also arrived with an announcement of a loss of another $160 million for that first quarter of that year. Um, if we could hit the slide again. You're one ahead of me, Bill, so, so that's okay. So uh, people uh, tease me. Uh, they said, uh, geez, John, uh, do you know what you're getting into? And the answer is yes. Um, I, my background's banking. One thing Bill didn't mention is that I, my background's banking. I've been CEO of uh, four or five different companies. It takes me a long time to learn things. And um, so I knew what I was getting into. I also knew that there was an opportunity for this institution for its place in the community. And this was a bank that you really did want to remain and continue to give back and participate uh, in the community. I also uh, should give credit. Uh, we've got a few people out here. We've got uh, Dennis Asono in particular, I'm thinking of, to all of our employees who were there before me and who have worked so hard, if you could only understand the effort that they put in to address and to fix uh, the pre credit problems over the last three years. Uh, in the second quarter of last year, we go to the, uh, our losses were reduced to $16 million. And I, I know that sounds terrible, but I've never thought I'd ever celebrate a loss of $16 million. <laughs> Um, but it was a significant improvement from prior periods. Um, and while our losses did increase slightly in the third quarter, we continued to show and report to the community significant improvement in our credit quality. Okay. In addition to the improvements uh, that we've made, uh, we've also made significant progress in recapitalizing the bank. Okay. Last quarter, our bank announced uh, key milestones in our $325 million uh, recapitalization plan. We secured two lead investors for a $195 million commitment. I think equally important is that uh, the Treasury, U.S. Treasury, agreed to convert its $135 million of preferred stock uh, into common stock and at a discount. 
this past December 22nd. Let's see, there we go. <laughs> we'll get it down. Thank you, Bill. This past December 22nd, uh, the remaining $130 million of the $325 million recapitalization plan uh, was fully subscribed. So, so cer subject to certain regulatory approvals, subject to certain terms and conditions and agreements with regulatory agencies and with our new investors, we're hoping to close this financing uh, next month. So uh, next slide. Uh, let me thank the, oh, thank you. But, uh, <laughs> We're not there yet, though. But mine was to uh, let me thank um, all of our CPB customers, but the entire community in Hawaii. Uh, we would not be here today except for that support. So we really do appreciate it. Thank you. Now, briefly, let me just give you some thoughts uh, that I have on trends in the venture capital industry. From 1990 through 2009, this industry saw an incredible rise and fall in the total number, amount of dollars raised by venture capitalists. Okay. Why? You know, what were the drivers? I think a lot of you in the audience are already aware. The primary reason for the declining interest of pension funds, of endowment funds, of universities in this asset class is very simple. For the past 10 years, the returns have been abysmal. If you're wondering why people are running from this asset class, you just need to look at that slide. I believe the well, it's, but if the challenge is going forward, uh, what's going to happen to us? Um, I think the primary reason for the performance was due to excess capital. The dot-com bu bubble of the late 90s that we all recall had long-lasting negative impact on venture returns. The excellent returns in the early days of the bubble resulted in exponential growth, an earlier slide that I had shown you, in the money raised by venture capitalists. In the year 2000, over $150 billion was raised by this industry. And no surprise to this audience, excess capital resulted in too much money chasing too few good deals, resulting in Companies receiving valuations that were too high. Companies receiving, especially this is on the mainland, companies receiving too much capital. And too many companies being funded in the same space. I don't know if you remember the dot com with the, the pet food companies dot com. And I think there were at least five of them by different venture firms. Bottom line, returns of the past 10 years have resulted in a significant reduction in this asset class. So where are we today? Many venture firms in Silicon Valley will not raise another fund. I sit on about 10 or 12, less so today, I've had to step off them, venture funds. And I can tell you that the, you're seeing just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I've seen funds that now have gone from annual fees of $20 million down to eight million dollars. I know you're going to say, I take eight hundred thousand a year in fees. But, but to leave you with is that they've been living for the last several years on the management fees of funds raised three, five, seven years ago, and they're disappearing. Many funds will raise additional funds, but much smaller dollar amounts. Some of the name brands in Silicon Valley, billion dollar funds, their most recent fund is in the 300 million to 400 million dollar range. So I want to leave you with, and I know it sounds negative, but I think if we're going to respond 
to uh, the changes out there in the best way we can. I think we have to look at it, at that market, at that environment. Recent research, I thought Tim, Tim Dickett is, uh, when he spoke in November, he uh, showed this slide, but some recent research. Um, if you look at smaller funds compared to larger funds, if you want to know a definition of the slide, feel free to ask me and I'll turn to Tim and say, okay, now explain this slide. But basically, because small funds have shifted over the last 20 years to be larger. A small fund 20 years ago might have been 10, 20 million where today it's probably a hundred million dollars. But if you compare any point in time the larger funds to the smaller funds, what you'll see is that LP investors did better investing in smaller funds. My observation, smaller funds tend to be more capital efficient. They're investing fewer dollars and usually in companies that have a product in beta and often that have some clients and some revenues. So what does this mean for all of the entrepreneurs uh, on the mainland or in Hawaii? I believe that entrepreneurs that can also demonstrate capital efficiency by bootstrapping, by having a product in beta um, before raising uh, your Series A round of financing, by being able to show that you can get to an exit uh, much more efficiently than other companies. I think these are the companies that are going to be of the greater interest to these new, smaller funds that are at least emerging in Silicon Valley today. I believe that Hawaii entrepreneurs have historically been more capital efficient. Someone said to me when I was sharing this, they said, yeah, we had to be. But whether that is true or not, I think as I've watched companies that I've watched pitch to me in Silicon Valley and I've watched companies here, uh, there's a discipline, perhaps because of a need, of that capital efficiency. So while there will be, for me, no doubt, fewer dollars available in our asset class, I think the tendency is going to be towards smaller funds. And I do believe smaller venture funds in Silicon Valley, elsewhere on the mainland, will increasingly be attracted to companies here in this state showing similar discipline. So those are my trends. Um, thank you for letting me share a little bit on the CPV story. And I think now, I think everyone will be interested in who's going to get, well, we know one award, but we're going to be interested in who's going to get other ones. Thank you very much. Well, that's the best news I've heard all day. Because we have small funds, and they are capital efficient, and our entrepreneurs do have discipline and have to struggle and bootstrap. So. Uh, very, very interesting insight into where, where things are. I think you stole one of my uh, sheets of paper, so I'm not totally handicapped. I know, we all know who the, this, uh, the first one is, right? You, you're going to go first, maybe not. There you go. It's my, my cheat sheet. You got two. Oh, no, no. Okay. Now, now I can get back on track. Um, well, now, just to, to keep you in suspense, more or less, for a few more seconds. Uh, I did want to tell you something that, um, that I think is a really big deal, is very important to, uh, uh, to Hawaii Venture Capital Association and the state of Hawaii. I, I wanted to let you know about uh, one of the things we do at Deal of the Year every year, which is um, we make a donation to the Career Technical Education Career Pathways Program which is a federal Department of Education funded uh, activity that gives high school kids in this state, all across the state, uh, an opportunity to have some very, very relevant experience. 
I know in, when I was in high school, the only kind of non-academic uh, activities you could get involved with were either extracurricular clubs, uh, the band or the symphony, or a metal shop or a wood shop. Well, it's a new world. And the career technical education program uh, has endeavored to bring relevancy into the high school by recruiting some top teachers within the programs to um, essentially offer kids the opportunity to learn something about what's out there other than being part of the tourist industry, which isn't a bad thing, but you know, there's more stuff out there like digital media, um, starting a business, could be any kind of business, um, a variety of areas. And, and so what we do is we ask our deal of the year winners to match our contribution and then make that available for prizes and, and cash prizes in particular so some of these teams that win the uh, competitions uh, can have a little money to go on for higher education and reward themselves for this uh, extra work. So um, just to tell you a, f a little bit more about the program and so you can have a face to associate with this and if you want to join us whether you're a deal of the year award winner or not and contribute, meet uh, Ms. Sherry Lynn Lau. Sherry, come on up. This is a, a great program. I've seen these kids. I've been a judge, so I've seen the business plan uh, winners, um, and they're just so excited to have this opportunity. You know, they, they really uh, take a disciplined approach. Um, the teachers are great. Tell us a little more about it, Sherry. Thank you, Bill, and thank you to Hawaii Venture Capital Association as well as Big Tech Hawaii for their support of our Career Pathways program. We put on every year what we call our student performance-based assessment activities. And it's based upon standards uh, for each career pathway, each program of study, that we've received input from business and industry as to what they want the students to know and be able to do. And we are expanding the program, and this is, I think, the seventh year for the business plan and marketing plan competitions. And several of you out here have been judges, and thank you very much for taking the time to judge the plans. We have a DVD. It's a nine minute DVD. It's also on Think Tech School's website. And we also have it now thanks to OceanNet. It's also on YouTube. And so you can see what the students have to do in order to win these competitions. And hopefully they become better candidates for you to employ when they get out there. Um, because of the rigor and the relevance in these programs, the Board of Education has now passed a uh, recognition, a designation on the diploma. So you might want to start asking applicants if they have the designation on the diploma. It will also come with a certificate of what, delineating what they had to do to get that certificate. So it delineates the standards and what we call the benchmarks or performance indicators. And our first designation, if the student qualifies, will be given out this school year in entrepreneurship and marketing. It does a great job with a limited amount of resources. And the thing that's really cool for me about this is, you know, it gives the kids something to look forward to. Uh, um, it motivates them to study and work hard because now they, you know, they have something to look forward to. They have a path, career path, and I think that's great. Okay, are you ready for the winners of this year's Deal of the Year awards? Who can it be? Who can it be? <laughs> well, the first one uh, is a company that was founded by Dr. Peter Schneider and Robert Giasoli. And um, it, we honored them uh, at the Entrepreneur of the Year Award for their great work in the biotech area. They have developed um, an alternative to stent technology that's uh, going to change. It's a game changer. It uh, is much more efficient and effective compared to other types of stents. And they're making great progress with a very limited budget, I might add. Um, so please uh, help me honor the 
founder, one of the founders' mother, who uh, is going to be accepting the award uh, on behalf of the two founders. Uh, please welcome Rosemary Giasoli. Rosemary? So now you know how Italians keep secrets. <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to keep a secret, but I did want to tell you that this company, Innovask, is a medical design company, and they are in their, uh, right now, are do, going for their CE mark, which is like the FDA approval. They've already done their human studies with a very limited budget, and so there's a very little window right now if anybody wants to still invest in it. It's, it's very, very exciting, and they've done a lot with a very low budget, like Bill has said. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And I'm sorry I gave away the secret. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, next up is a company that um, actually won last year. So it's our it's one of our winners last year. It's the first time we've had uh, two in a row uh, to acknowledge. This company, um, you know as a real pioneering organization in the production of biodiesel. Um, and uh, they've established plants all over the country, and now they're embarking on a, a, a brand new plant on the Big Island. Please welcome Kelly King, co-founder of Pacific Biodiesel. Wow, thank you so much for um, this acknowledgement. It's so great to be here twice in a row and for the same project. Um, this happened because towards the end of last year, um, when we were uh, looking at the budget for Big Island Biodiesel, and we realized at the point we were at, we could either be over budget or we could raise another 15% and double the size of the plant and be right on target. Um, we decided to do that in the last three days of 2010. And thanks to what was left of QHTB, we were able to do that and get the money in, you know, most of the money in by the end of the year. And so I really want to make that statement because that program, even though it expired last year, um, needs to be, have, be resurrected in some way, shape, or form because it really does mean a lot to folks. And I think the way it was last year where, you know, they, they did get rid of the two-for-ones, but it was still a good, uh, a good program for local investors. So I want to do that little pitch. And, um, and just real quickly, um, uh, run by those of you who don't know Pacific Biodiesel, that we, you know, we started 15 years ago, and we did, we were a bootstrapper. We, um, we spent the first 13 years of our existence just putting everything we earned back into the next project. And so our companies right now are Pacific Biodiesel Incorporated, Cleanway, which is the trucking company that picks up all the used cooking oil here. Pacific Biodiesel Technologies, which is in uh, Salem, Oregon, and that's our R&D and our fuels lab. Sequential Pacific Biodiesel, which is the biodiesel plant that we are invested in, built, and own and, and uh, operate in Salem. Encore Oils, which is the trucking company over there that picks up the used cooking oil. And, and by the way, we're the biggest um, grease hauler in the Pacific Northwest. That's sort of a dubious title. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Pacific Biodiesel, Texas. And so, <laughs> so our newest project, Big Island Biodiesel, um, is, a, is a separate LLC. And we, brought, uh, we have 19 investor groups, all of whom are based in Hawaii. So we're really proud of the fact that it's a, it's a very local company. Um, and then and the other part of it is that two years ago, we decided to um, start giving our partners in Pacific Biodiesel dividends and then and building these plants by bringing investors in. And we've had such a great reception. We, we actually, even after we closed the first part of the offering, had phone calls of people who you know, wanted to be involved in, in the project. So um, we brought some new people in when we opened it back up for the second offering. And, um, and we just uh, you know, had a board meeting, uh, a, a administration meeting uh, yesterday, and going over the numbers, we're told that um, our total revenues for all of our companies is uh, a little over $25 million. So for somebody that started by, you know, was in our pockets 15 years ago, that was, that's, it, we really come a long way. Most of that is on the mainland, but the model of the biodiesel plant that's on the mainland that's, that's just, um, in my husband's words, kicking butt this year, um, is the one that we're bringing to the Big Island. So we're looking forward to major expansion and also having a, 
a large impact on the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. So and the last thing I want to do is just again announce, uh, introduce um, someone who's helping us get to that next level, and Kim Vanderlyn, um, who introduced herself earlier. She's our new CFO, but she, she, was, um, she became a partner in Levin and Who, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, accounting firms on Maui. And she became a partner last year, and so somehow we were lucky enough to, to actually attract her away from <laughs> that very prestigious position. So um, I wanted to honor her as well. And, um, and also thank you, Bill, for um, the, including the career pathways, because some of you don't know this, but I used to be, I used to sit on the State Board of Education, so anytime we can interface with the Department of Education, I'm really happy about that. Thank you very much. In addition, I don't think you mentioned to processing the cooking oil, uh, they're also going to be accepting um, materials from uh, farmers on the Big Island. So creating uh, other economic opportunities for uh, the community, which is very important. And uh, my venture hopes to be using your product and what we're trying to do as well, because we want to be a clean energy oriented. OK, so last but not least, um, I'd like to introduce you to a company that uh, I, I feel uh, very passionate about, because uh, Shenoa Farnsworth and I were asked to be the final coaches for this company uh, when they were preparing for uh, the uh, UH business plan competition. And that was about, what, two years ago. Uh, they were the winners of the UH business plan competition. And so Shenno and I f feel like we have a, a little elbow grease in the, in the company, I think. Um, it was founded, as I understand from uh, Tim, um, during an intense planning session on Super Bowl Sunday in 2008. So I guess you just were watching the commercials and then during the game you were planning the business. Um, it's, uh, it's an exemplary uh, company uh, for another reason because it, it's a demonstration of uh, Marcy Greenwood's um, Innovation uh, Council recommendation, which is to start looking more carefully at, at how you can commercialize IP coming out of the University of Hawaii. Uh, and this is a big challenge uh, that, of course, people have been working on for years, uh, but um, the, the key is having entrepreneurial uh, people in UH who uh, are developing uh, new technologies and new techniques. So uh, I'll let Tim tell you a little bit more about this great company, Adama Materials. Deal of the Year winner for 2010. Thank you, Bill. Thanks to everyone here at uh, HVC. I'm going to try to move this up a little bit there. Is that working? So, can everybody hear? Um, what I want to do today is I'm going to give you one sentence about what the company does and then try to tell a little story that I think you'll find involves maybe a quarter of the room. This is a great story of about how companies in Hawaii can get started. We'd like to think more can be done too. So, uh, the one word pitch on Adama Materials, the promise of nanomaterials as active ingredients in composites, things like fiberglass and carbon fiber. Sounds simple, people have been telling this story for 10, 15 years. And the story usually goes like this. Well, we've got an amazing new composite material. It's twice as strong as regular carbon fiber. You say, well, that sounds pretty good. Time passes and eventually they get to the punchline. and say, well, how much does it cost? Well, it is 10 times as expensive. <laughs> and then the room kind of goes silent and, and you know, people finish up the meeting very politely. So it's been a big challenge. Cost nanomaterials are expensive and so forth. So the exciting and very simple thing about the value proposition that uh, the scientists at UH have come up with is a way to do not just twice but maybe more in terms of strength and other uh, characteristics at a very, very low price point. So we think that could make a great company in terms of its ability to be profitable but it also gives you the ability to put better materials, less of them. We think about your really strong material, you can use a lot less of it in really inexpensive things. Shower pans, bathtubs. Everybody talks about, ooh, the Boeing Dreamliner, wouldn't that be cool? 20 years later, you might be flying around in an airplane. We want things that are very big markets that are very quick to adopt. So that's the one sentence pitch on Adama materials. There's more, but that's the real simple version, the reason that we really liked it. So 
Uh, but at the end of the day, I wouldn't be standing up here in front of you if it wasn't for an awful lot of people. So we've got a bunch of our team here. For some reason, they're way down in the back for the most part. I think you heard from Donovan Kiloha. Donovan's down here. Donovan and Dr. Najad and Richard on, Russ. The original. Come on up. Yes, get up here. Uh, Vamshi Gudipati, Dave Nemiroff, um, all part of the founding team, uh, who did win the business plan competition. I think was it 2008? It was 2008, right? 2009 was the Super Bowl Sunday use of proceeds. Here comes Rich. So the, and the rest of my team are shy. So come on. Um, the great thing about this, though, is it's really a pan-university effort. The business plan competition was via the Shidru School of Business and also <laughs> co-sponsored by, apparently, Hawaiian Tel. Um, it's your fault, Tim. It's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Turn my ringer up. Is it my fault? <laughs> Okay, is it AT&T then? <laughs> um, the business school, so I'd like you obviously. Uh-oh, this one, you better take that one. The ringer's on. John, it's you calling. <laughs> I can't do anything about it. It's, it's going to rain. Steve Jobs so. is calling. Steve Jobs, I'm sorry, forget him. This isn't about, for, for once, it's not about Steve. So, the rest of my team, Pedro, uh, uh, Valencia, Bamshi Gudapati, Donovan Kiloha, one of the original founders, Dave Nemiroff, Richard Russ, and uh, Dr. Madan Najad. Uh, the three of them used that Super Bowl Sunday in, in 2009 very productively in association with uh, the business school. And also Peter Crouch is here, the Dean of Engineering. Obviously, Dr. Najad is the chairman of the graduate division and, and the, uh, the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So a lot of cooperation. Also, someone who isn't here, is uh, Lee Taylor, who tried to make it from the Office of Technology Transfer. Uh, one of the things that's made this company pro uh, uh, possible is a very innovative way of working at the Office of Tech Transfer, uh, which we think is a model for how the university can do that. The, uh, the university today has a big chunk of equity in Adama, so they have some skin in the game of our success, too. So great story of the University of Hawaii. Uh, a little bit after that, um, B. Lang Chua, I Beam got involved, so in terms of coaching the company, um, as well as people like Billy Richardson, and Billy had a very special role in how the company actually got to us. So um, Billy uh, was in the midst of uh, doing his own fundraising. He said, there's this company, it's got a lot of technology in it. Um, why don't you take a look at it? Maybe you guys can figure this out. So, so we took a look at it, John took a look at it, I took a look at it, said, you know, this really works. This could be something really big. So we got in and kind of rolled up our sleeves and started, I guess you would call it incubating the deal. Um, we went through all of the technology, all the business plans, all the economics. Uh, we said, this looks great, but you know, we need a little more proof here because some of the technology hasn't achieved, uh, um, achieved a proof of concept. And that's pretty important if you're going to be raising substantial cash. So we put together a little uh, walking around money. I think Halloween of 2009, right? Halloween of 2009, we did a quarter million dollar um, bridge note. Um, Elaine participated, um, uh, Global and, and, uh, uh, participated and uh, sent one of their folks. Dave Hales couldn't be here today, but was able to get one of his staff from North Dakota to volunteer for the arduous task of coming and joining us today here in, in Honolulu. So. Somebody uh, had to come. <laughs> <laughs> so we like to, uh, are you going to be staying for a few days at least, or do you have to get right back on the plane? No, I'm going to stay one more day here and then going to Maui tomorrow. Okay, well, we hope you can come and visit us, and we'll take you through what we That would be great. So, awesome. Okay, let's do that. Um, so we kept going on this, and we had brought in at this point another larger venture firm that started up capital, because we're a small fund, as John pointed out, by the name of Artiman Ventures. And their managing partner, Ahmed Shah, and one of their EIRs, Frank Thibodeau, who I've known for about 20 years, got involved and they too rolled up their sleeves. So now we had, uh, these guys were having probably more help than they could stand at this point with all these VCs <laughs> saying, no, we want you to do this, work on polyester, not the glamorous stuff. And uh, fortunately, the, uh, the polyester and some of the other tests went very, very well. And then in September 30th of 2010, uh, we finished up with a $4.75 million Series A, for which we're delighted. Um, so that's really the story. I think there's a few other people we need to thank. We need, obviously, as startup capital, Elizabeth Akata is here, and Johnny Vitani from Kamehameha, 
So in terms of limited partners and how we as a venture ca uh, uh, capital company work within the community, they're playing a part. So John was talking to you about the, uh, uh, the funds that are being raised. Um, people think, you know, entrepreneurs think, oh, we go to the VCs and they have all the money. Well, no, the VCs have to go lock, knock on the door of the LPs, so there's always someone else to answer to. And uh, so we hope that uh, Elizabeth and John are going to be proud of this investment in particular being right here in Hawaii. It's our third investment in a Hawaii-based company as, at Startup Capital. Um, thanks are in order as well to, um, obviously, uh, EF Hawaii, Leanne Miyasato, Ben Wo, uh, John Dean. We've tried to contribute to that as, uh, as part of our fundraising. We think being part of the community here is very, very important to kind of the ethos of our company. Uh, being part of the, uh, the community here, we want to continue to give back to the Venture Capital Association. Uh, what did we do? Last year we sponsored a program where students can now, how, what, what's the price now that students can come 20 to? 20 bucks. 20 bucks. So if you're a student, please tell your students or your schools that they can come to the venture capital meetings now for $20. So that's something else we've tried to do within the community. The last person I'd like to think is, is Pia Arma. She's our PR a agent who is the loneliest person in town because she calls me up and says, can I talk about anything? What about that new hire you're doing? Oh, no, no, especially not the new hire. If they find out we're hiring PhD polymer chemists, they'll, and all our competitors will be all over us. So uh, poor Pia, but I do want to give her credit. She's done a great work, and we hope to have something for you next year, maybe another year. So, so um, I suppose we should thank um, Carl and Yuka Nakashima as well. We're tenants at MIC, another great state program whereby we get below market rents until we're old enough to fly. Uh, so many areas where the community, uh, state agencies, educational resources, nonprofit resources have helped this company from its very steep stages to where we are. Now the award we really want to win, Phil, is the exit of the year. That's the real prize, so we'll celebrate this one. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Great team of people. And as Tim said, it takes a village. And we're happy to be part of that, part of the nexus that uh, brings together a fine group like you all to honor entrepreneurs uh, who really are heroes in our community. And uh, so we thank you for doing that. We've got some time to do a little networking and get to know each other better. So uh, thank you all for attending. Remember, February 24th is our next uh, meeting on APEC and what it'll do for Hawaii businesses. Thank you all for coming, and Happy New Year.